Hi, my plant people. My name's Stuart Moore, and on this video, I'm gonna talk about ways that you can mitigate the amount of maintenance you have to do in your landscape. Stay tuned. Stick around. So hi guys, like I said, we are going to go over some tips and tricks on how to mitigate the amount of landscape maintenance that you're going to have. If you have a small bed, if you have a big bed, it's not gonna matter. I use the word mitigate, not stop maintenance, right? We're gonna mitigate the amount of maintenance because the last thing I wanna do is lure you into a false sense of security that there's something called a maintenance-free landscape. There is not. There might be, but it's gonna require you to go to Hobby Lobby and buy a bunch of flowers and just stick them in the ground. That being said, I wanna go over some misinformation, one of which is weed barrier. Oh, weed barrier. Your name implies that you're gonna stop weeds. Weed barrier does not stop weeds! How dare you! Well, I guess it kind of does in some applications, but in all honesty, weed barrier is not gonna keep the weeds that pester us like dandelions that float in from the cosmos and make it very difficult to keep a weed-free landscape. Now, landscape fabric, I've used it in the past, for like hedges that we were going to use gravel underneath there you know there was nothing else going in that hedgerow and that keeps those little walnut trees and those little green briars and and uh you know ash trees catalpa trees stuff like that from floating into and depositing itself right by where the drip irrigation is and then all of a sudden the super hospitable place this catalpa is growing 10 times faster than the rosa sharon the walnut tree so it has its place I would suggest you don't use weed barrier when you're using mulch, and here's why. Mulch cools the soil. It creates this great, you're reintroducing organic matter. It's a great environment. You got beneficial bacteria munching on stuff. It's a, um, a fungus-rich environment. Your plants are loving it. You get mushrooms popping up. It's great. But as everybody's doing their job, as the plant's employees are breaking down organic matter and doing all that jazz, you're creating a secondary soil profile above that weed barrier. Under no circumstances should you ever put plastic in your flower beds, ever. I have no idea where that started. Cheap six mil black plastic underneath. It, gravel, mulch, I don't care. Never ever put plastic in your flower beds. You're keeping an oxygen exchange from happening. There's no water happening. What are we doing? What, what are we doing? Why would we ever do that? On a lighter note, landscape fabric is basically a weave, right? So it's, we it's woven and you can have that oxygen exchange and you can have that water exchange. Okay, so that's a thing that's happening. If you need to use weed barrier, just remember that f seeds floating in are still gonna deposit and they're still gonna grow. Weed barrier is just going to let you pull those weeds out very easily. That dandelion carrot root that comes down isn't gonna be able to gain purchase. It's gonna just kinda hit the weed barrier and grow along the weed barrier. It's really easy to pull out and just shake it off. The problem's gonna arise when you go to plant annuals or when you go to plant or add or separate or the work that you're gonna be doing in your, in your bed. Because if you remember in some of my previous videos, I like to use flower beds as a way to grow plants for other projects or to give away, right? Weed barrier makes it diff very difficult for me to do that. So weed barrier, there's some good and there's some bad, but for the average homeowner, you do not need weed barrier. It is not something that's gonna be that advantageous for you. And down the road, it's gonna cause you problems unless it's in a hedgerow where you're not ever gonna do anything else. That is gonna be a hedge. That's gonna be a Rosa Sharon hedge. That's going to be a, a burning bush hedge. That's gonna be a butterfly bush hedge. That's what we're doing in that area. You can put a four foot width of weed barrier through there because that maturity or whatever mature width you're going to get on your hedgerow and then use the weed barrier for that purpose so that way you don't get those trees, um, those squirrels aren't burying walnuts and stuff. Try that with weed barrier, but other than that, 
I say no weed barrier. Leave a comment in below. Have you had a good success with weed barrier? Is that something that you have always used? Landscapers, let me know. Is that something that you push when you, uh, when you talk to your customer? Okay, so for my second tip, but like I was saying, just kind of some tips and tricks, no particular order, but is how do we handle those weeds that are floating in? Pre-emergence, so this is the high yield trefland, okay? So pre-emergence are going to keep things from germinating. So before it emerges, pre-emergence. So it keeps things from emerging. Where Roundup, you know, horticultural vinegar, things like that, the more organic, obviously Roundup isn't organic, but there is some organic ways to control weeds um, would be a post-emergent. So after, post meaning after, it's emerged. So I do use pre and post-emergence. Now, treflan or preen or any pre-emergent, be really wary of of lawn fertilizers that are pre-emergence using those in your flower beds because it might not be something you need and they might have post-emergent qualities. So they might be a pre-emergent with post-emergent qualities and you don't want to mess with that. So I would go with just the straight horticultural treflan. I use the lowest dose that uh, high yield uh, has, which is like 1.47 or something like that. Um, that that's kind of my bag when it comes to pre-emergence i bought a hand spreader from goodwill for like two dollars and fifty cents it was brand new had the stickers on it and i just have a a, a get and go cup or something in there that i dump in and i just spin it and usually one and a half i fill up that hand spreader about one and a half times and it does all my landscape and I just go through and I just kind of every three months just put some some uh, some pre-emergent down now here's the tips part of that because anybody can tell you use pre-emergent right so I use pre-emergent instead of I use pre-emergence and post-emergence instead of weed barrier and the price price wise comes out in the wash the labor price you know if I was charging per project how much labor it takes to put down weed barrier uh, oh geez Louise it's a nightmare this is so much easier for me I mean I love it so the tip part of this is when I'm actively doing something in the landscape whenever I go in there and I separate a perennial or whatever I have a little bit of trefland with me I'm always wearing gloves uh, and I'll just put some trefland down in that area that I disturbed. So I'm kind of like reintroducing some trefland. It's so low dose, it's not gonna hurt anything. You can still walk up to your service berry and pop some berries into your mouth. It doesn't translate into the, you know, into the berry. So at that low dose, it's very safe for even, uh, you know, tomato beds and things like that. But uh, let's follow such as some basic fundamentals and uh, keep anything chemical free out of our tomato beds. Uh, I think that's just a safe practice. But for my flower beds, I use the lowest dose that I can get of a pre-emergent, the lowest amount percentage of active ingredient, I think is the best way to, for us to think about that is, uh, Treflan is a pre-emergent and then I used a post-emergent afterwards and I use a post-emergent mostly folks, and I'm just gonna 100% honest with you, mostly, the post-emergent application is for Bermuda grass that's trying to crawl across my barrier and get into my flower beds. It's got nothing to do, I, I don't have broadleaf weeds in my flower beds because of the post, because of the pre-emergent. Okay, I hope you utilize that tip because it's super cheap. I think this big old 30 pound, what size bag is this? I don't know, I sell it all the time. You think I would know by now. A 15 pound bag is 20 bucks. And I still have probably, oh man, at least half a bag left. And I've been doing it for two years at this new house. Uh, yeah, about two years. So uh, it, a little bit goes a long way. Now, if you start using a come and go cup or something like that and just spreading it across, that's going to eat through it. I would suggest just go get in a hand spreader. The amount of material that you're going to save by having one of those, it's even worth buying one at full price. Now, for my third tip and I have to admit, this is probably my favorite, is keeping your plants healthy. Roots transplant packets, 
is endo and ecto mycorrhizal fungi, okay? So this has the mycorrhiza hyphae in a dormant form. Those spores are dormant in here. And it also has the beneficial rhizospheric bacteria in here also, okay? So this all springs to life when it gets some water. The mycorrhiza is gonna spring to life when it gets a, a help wanted signal from the plant, okay? Um, there's also another product um, called Biotone, okay? which is also a biological fertilizer. All organics been around a long time. I have no idea how long the company, I do, I have a general idea. I think it's like 1919 or something like that. This company, Espoma has been in business, right? Family owned and operated. A good business, a good business model, right? So this has the endo and ecto mycorrhizal fungi in it. It also, in the dormant spore form, it also has the beneficial bacteria in it, okay? This is like $9 for a four pound bag. It can do, I use, I can get 12 three gallon, I can plant 12 three gallon plants with one of these. And it's gonna bring in more water and nutrients. Watch that other video, it goes into more detail, but it brings in more water and nutrients for the plant. That's the beneficial fungus. The rhizospheric bacteria is going to make a more efficient area around the root. Because remember, roots can only take in nutrients that are right up against the root. They can't take up nutrients that are five inches away from a root hair. So that's where the beneficial fungus comes in. The beneficial bacteria are making their home life of that root a lot more efficient. This is... Fertilome's root stimulator. Now, this root stimulator is not a B vitamin or willow bark extract or any of the BS that I see on YouTube. This is a chemical product that is going to mechanically create more roots. And when I say mechanically, it's actually going to burn the tip of that root, all right, and then create more fine root growth because those dormant those dormant nodes that are only gonna to spring to life when the tip of that root hair gets damaged, it's, those are gonna to spring to life. So essentially, if I just use scientific reasonable deduction, this makes a lot of sense to me. This is just like reasonable deduction. I called the rep, I, I explained how I was going to explain this and he's like, yep, that, that's how it works. So anyway, it's gonna create more surface area for your beneficial fungus and beneficial bacteria to utilize, right? So that's what this is doing. It's creating more surface area for the rhizospheric bacteria and it's creating more ports for your beneficial fungus to latch onto so then it can, th that hyphae can then grow into the uh, soil profile. And uh, mushrooms in your landscape are a good thing, guys. That means you have a rich, and biodiverse environment underneath the ground. That means you have those hyphae just growing all around. Don't eat the mushrooms. I know nothing about what mushrooms are and are not edible. A two year fertilizer tablet. Look at this little guy, look at this little guy. Last two years, so it's a two year fertilizer tablet. I'm absolutely in love with these things. I put one on each side of a one gallon perennial, uh, like a black eyed Susan or an echinacea. It's blowing my mind. I mean, think about what we're doing. We're, we're incorporating beneficial fungus and bacteria whenever we plant anything. We're using root stimulator. I like to use root stimulator every 30 days for the first year. Uh, and I've kind of got a system down to where it's pretty efficient to do. Um, and then I use two-year fertilizer tablets. The combination of those three things, guys, there is nothing more you could be doing for your landscape. Um, and these are gonna last two years. They're super slow release. You can put them right up against the root ball and the roots just kind of like wrap around it like it's a rock. It, it's not water soluble, okay? So it doesn't matter how much rain you're getting. This uses the beneficial bacteria is gonna break this down. Right, so that rhizospheric bacteria that we're talking about, it's gonna break it down. The other beneficial bacteria that are just kind of hanging out in the profile that aren't necessarily live in that rhizosphere, they're gonna be breaking this down and then making that available to the plant. So it's not water soluble. Um, I think the combination of those three things, guys, I challenge, uh, well, you could probably do it. I'm not gonna say that. I put seven of these around a Shasta Daisy. If I went above what the manufacturer was suggesting, is it slow release enough that it wouldn't kill that Shasta Daisy? And that Shasta Daisy just got huge. That's, that's what happened, you know? So it didn't hurt 
the Shasta Daisy at all. So guys, I really appreciate you sticking with me through this, and I hope these tips will help you take on more ambitious landscape projects. Uh, if you like the content, leave a like, subscribe, hit the bell so you know when we put out more videos like this. Let's build a community and leave some comments for each other. Let's, let's support each other because um, this is probably one of the greatest things that you could do with your free time. Now I know it's not overly manly to sit out there and play in a bunch of wave petunias, but I'll tell you, um, you know, just that, that general ambiance of being around living things and butterflies and bees and doing all that jazz. I mean, I'm, I'm, I love it. So I'm Stuart Moore. Thank you very much for letting me into your home to talk about plants.